Once you have the basic toolkit of game theory down, you can start to apply game theory to economic phenomena. Here, our application will be game theory applied to the firm. The main example of game theory applied to the firm is often shown as collusion as a prisoner's dilemma game. Collusion being firms trying to come together to set a monopoly price in an oligopoly setting and trying to keep everybody else from undercutting the price within the oligopoly and trying to keep quantities low, prices high, so that they get the extra producer surplus from the monopoly pricing as shown in a collusion problem. In this collusion setting, it's the same thing, uh, the same problem really as a prisoner's dilemma game. Everyone would like everyone to cooperate, so in the collusion setting, everyone would like the other firms to not lower the price, to not increase their quantity, and in the prisoner's dilemma game, both sides who are under interrogation would like the other side to cooperate and not rat themselves out, and not confess to the crimes that they have committed. Uh, but both of them, in both situations, there's a dominant strategy at play. So, in a collusion game, there's a dominant strategy to cheat the system, to undercut the price that the colluding firms have set, and to ruin, basically, the producer surplus gains for all, and basically start a pricing war which will drive down the prices and lead towards a competitive outcome as opposed to a collusive oligopoly outcome. Because it's a dominant strategy for every firm to cheat the system no matter what the other firms do, we often end up seeing a situation where we get driven down to this competitive price and out to the competitive quantity and we end up losing, for the oligopoly firms, this yellow rectangle area of producer surplus. If all the other firms cheat, it's to your advantage to cheat as well and to lower the price to the competitive price. If none of the other firms cheat and they keep the price up at the monopoly price, it's your incentive to cheat the system and basically take all of the consumers in the market and get yourself some surplus and negatively impact those around you. So you have this dominant strategy to always cheat and thus we often see competitive outcomes when firms cannot find ways to overcome the collusion problem and they can't overcome the problems of monitoring the other firms in the market. Here we have a basic payoff matrix showing this prisoner's dilemma with the problem of collusion. Here in the white we have the payoff for firm A, and here in the orange we have a payoff for firm B. Uh, we can see that if we look at firm A's decision to either do high production and cheat the system, high quantities, lower prices, or low production, uh, keeping their quantity limited so you could charge the monopoly price, you can see that they have a dominant strategy to do high production or to cheat the system. If we compare their choice, let's hold player B or firm B's choice constant. If firm B cheats, firm A has the choice between a payoff of 12000 if they cheat and 11250 if they decide not to cheat, if they collude. Well, they would definitely take the $12,000 profit given the payoff system of game theory. 12000 is greater than 11250 so they would cheat. If we hold firm B's action constant to collude, then again, firm A has the choice between 13.5 and 12.5. They will take the 13.5. So no matter what firm B does, firm A will choose to cheat. And thus we know we will be in this top row. Firm B faces the same situation. You hold firm A's actions constant. Let's say they decide to collude. Firm B gets the payoffs in the orange. If we are in this, the bottom row right here where firm A is colluding, firm B has the choice between 12.5 and 13.5. They choose the 13.5 or cheat. If firm A is cheating, we hold their action constant and we'd say what would firm B choose? They have the choice between 11.25 and 12 and thus they would choose 12. So again, they would cheat and thus they have a dominant strategy to always cheat. So we end up with firm B cheating, firm A cheating, and we get the dominant solution 
of cheat, cheat, which is worse than if they would both just cooperate. Now let's turn to the Carnot model of the firm. In the Carnot oligopoly setting, one firm's output choice, if it's increased, it effectively decreases the demand for the other firm's output. In other words, if a firm decides to increase their quantity, the second firm then, their best alternative is actually to have a lower quantity. In a normal setting, we usually talk about this within economics, uh, in terms of residual demand curves that the firm faces or residual marginal revenue curves. What that essentially means is that you have a, your demand is affected by the other firm's demand or your output decision is affected by the other firm's output decision. So here what we're going to have is what's known as a reaction function. What that means is that you have an optimal reaction to the other firm's activity. You have an optimal response to their activity. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that reaction function the best you can possibly do in reaction to the other firm's, sit, uh, the other firm's action. We're going to be able to graph that. And we can graph that for both firms and we can end up with a nice equilibrium. So let's get to that. All right, so here we have the uh, two firms. We have uh, firm DI and then firm PR. Uh, along the horizontal axis, you see the quantity that the firm PR ends up producing. And along the vertical, you see the quantity that firm DI produces. Then what we can see is we can see that we have a reaction fun function for firm PR and a reaction function for firm DI. Let's look at the reaction function for firm PR first. If we see, if we look at this, we can see the quantity of firm DI on the vertical. This curve, the PR reaction curve, is going to show us the relation to what firm DI does. If firm DI produces a quantity of 100, you can see that the optimal reaction for firm PR is to produce zero. If firm uh, QR, or sorry, PR is responding to QD, and QD produces instead 50 as their quantity, you could go out on the quantity of 50 until you hit the PR reaction curve, and you'd see that firm PR produces somewhere around 30 if firm DI is producing 50. So this is their optimal reaction to whatever quantity firm QDI or DI produces. Now we also have DI's reaction curve to the quantity that P firm PR produces. So if PR produces a whole bunch, DI produces nothing. Uh, if firm Q PR produces a quantity of zero, then what we end up with is the reaction of firm DI is quite high, in this case 50. So you could pick any quantity for firm PR and see what the reaction is for firm DI. Now on this graph you can also see a couple of points just to show a general relation here. If we were to say that we were at a Carnot equilibrium at point A, which we will get to, uh, then we also need to understand that that's going to be a lower combined quantity than if we were in the competitive outcome but higher than if we were in the collusive, a collusive setting uh, where we basically charged a monopoly price for a monopoly quantity. Remember that a Carnot is essentially a mix of results, somewhere between the competitive outcome and the collusive outcome. So here we show why the cross in the two lines ends up being the actual equilibrium point in a Carnot uh, setting. Here we have the reaction cur curve for two different firms. So we have firm 1 listed here and firm 2 listed here. So, and then we have the reaction curve for firm 1 and the reaction curve for firm 2. So what we're stating is that, okay, let's say firm 1 decides to pick an output somewhere uh, very far out there. Firm 2 is going to react in a certain way by producing very, very little in terms of their optimal quantity. If firm 2 decides to do a very small quantity, 
Firm 1's optimal reaction curve would not be just to stay at this point, which is Firm 2's reaction. It would be to be on their reaction curve at that quantity for Firm 2. So if Firm 2 selects a low level of quantity, we need to go out from that quantity to see where that hits Firm 1's reaction curve. And it hits right here at the, at the furthest south point on the graph of Firm 1's reaction curve. So if we started here, we would move over to here. Now, if Firm 1 behaves in this manner, what Firm 2 is going to do is they're going to say, okay, Firm 1 is producing this output level. Uh, and if Firm 1 is at that output level, then what we do is at that output level, where are we at on our reaction curve? And that pulls us up to this point here. And if Firm 2 decides to produce this quantity, then Firm 1 says, okay, what's my reaction to Firm 2 producing this quantity? And we move over to Firm 1's reaction curve at that quantity. And then Firm 1 is deciding, oh, we produce this many, so Firm 2 responds to that. And we keep moving up the curve until we hit the actual point where they cross. And then there's no longer any incentive to keep moving further away from that point. We'd stick at that equilibrium point where my reaction to your choice is now neutral. Your choice of whatever output you have as Firm 2 is perfectly consistent with my choice as Firm 1 reacting towards you. And then so I stay put as Firm 1, and with me staying put as Firm 1, your reaction function says to stay put as Firm 2 as well, and so we, so we reach that equilibrium point. In this situation, each firm is maximizing its profits given its belief about the other firm's output decision. This is a Carnot equilibrium using a reaction function graph. Now an extension of the Carnot equilibrium is the Stackelberg model of oligopoly. Remember that the difference between a Carnot model and a Stackelberg model is essentially the only difference is that we have non-simultaneous behavior in the Stackelberg model. We have sequential moving, so we have a leader firm and a follower firm. So in the Carnot equilibrium, we got both these reaction functions and we end up at an equilibrium state. But here what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the, uh, having a leader firm going first and a follower firm going second. So we have the reaction function originally in the Carnot, Carnot model for the leader firm was this red line and the following firm was this blue line. In a Stackelberg model, right, we're in a Stackelberg oligopoly situation, we have the leader acting first and the second player reacting or following. So what we do is we really have just a reaction curve, a reaction function for the second firm. The first firm does not have a reaction function anymore. They have an action function, essentially. They get to pick first. So we can basically eliminate the reaction function from the leading firm. And we'll see, we don't have the information here, but we'd see that the first firm would pick a higher quantity than they would in the Carnot model as they get to move first and the second firm has to respond to them. So they can basically be a bigger part of the market. So they would pick some higher quantity here and then we would see where that hits firm two, the follower's reaction function, and they would have a lower quantity than the Carnot equilibrium. So the Stackelberg equilibrium will show a different result than the double reaction function cur curve model. We'd actually just have one reaction function here, essentially the second firm, because we have a leader and a follower in a Stackelberg model of a Carnot oligopoly setting. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at mixed strategies as a result from the ideas of game theory. In this situation, we can think of two firms or three firms uh, competing against each other. And what we want to see is that often in real world strategic settings, it's beneficial to mix your strategies. So if one firm is in direct competition with another firm, and the first firm always does the same thing, so say they always... Um, release a bit their big sale at the start of January or they always do a big marketing scheme in the middle of May firm 2 can then predict firm 1's behavior and try to basically outcompete them beat their strategy because they know exactly when they're going to be doing things but if firm 1 plays a mix of strategies and firm 2 isn't going to be able to predict 
what firm one is doing all the time, it weakens their ability to triumph within the market. And so it's very beneficial sometimes to mix strategies so that your direct competitors cannot steal customers from you, cannot um, basically make your marketing schemes fall flat or your sales um, get compete out competed by other firms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It depends on the actual application, but at times it'll be beneficial to mix up your strategy. We're going to model this using the game of tennis as strategic behavior. This example comes from the international best-selling business book, Thinking Strategically, which goes through game theoretic strategies for firms, businessmen, politicians, etc. Teaches the basic lessons of game theory written by Dixit and Nailbluff. And what they did in their idea of thinking about tennis with mixed strategies is they talked about the basic behavior of a server and a receiver in tennis. They did this to illuminate the idea of two firms competing against each other in a zero-sum game situation. What each firm is trying to do is trying to prevent exploitation by the other firm. So they're trying to prevent the ability of the other firm to exploit any patterns in their behavior. They draw this parallel to tennis as well. When a server goes back to serve, he can either serve towards the forearm or the forehand or the backhand side of the receiver. And the receiver, a lot of times, can kind of anticipate either a shot to the forehand side or to the backhand side. And so they are strategically playing off of each other, trying to exploit any patterns in the other's behavior. So here we have the basic payoffs um, from this behavior, the probability that the receiver successfully returns the serve. What the server would like to do is to minimize this output, and what the receiver would like to do is maximize this output. So we can look at the server's aim. If the server aims towards the forehand and the receiver anticipates the forehand, then the receiver wins 90% of those points or has a successful return on 90% of those points. If the server aims towards the forehand and the receiver was anticipating backhand, the receiver only wins or successfully returns 30% of those balls. If the server aims towards the backhand and the receiver guesses forehand, it's a 20% payoff for the a receiver, and it's a 60% payoff for the receiver if the server aims towards the backhand and the receiver guesses backhand. We'll get 60% of the balls returned successfully by the receiver. If you do not play a mixed strategy in this situation, it becomes rather obvious uh, that it, you can be exploited. So let's do the extreme and have the server always aim at the forehand. If the server always aims at the forehand, what's the receiver going to do? They're going to anticipate forehand as a serve, and they're going to get 90% as their success rate. But if the server mixes between aiming towards the backhand and the forehand, there's probably no chance whatsoever, and there really is no chance, that the receiver could do basically anything and have higher than a 90% success rate. So we're going to do a mixed strategy graph to show these payoffs. Notice that if the receiver anticipates the forehand, so if you go back to the payoff matrix and you can look at this, the receiver anticipates the forehand, they will have a success rate of 90% if the server serves towards the forehand 100% of the time. So this is the percentage that the server is serving towards the forehand. If they do it 100% of the time and the receiver anticipates the forehand, they would get 90% success rate. If the server instead served 0% of the balls towards the forehand and the receiver still anticipated the forehand completely, the payoff for the receiver would be only 20% success rate. Then you can do the exact same for the receiver anticipating the backhand. If the receiver is anticipating the backhand, and the server serves to the forehand every single time, if the server's aiming towards the forehand, forehand every single time, and the receiver moves to the backhand, they have a payoff of 30. While if they're anticipating the backhand, but the server goes to the, back, or goes to the forehand zero times, 
they will have a payoff of 60%. So in other words, if the server always goes to the backhand or zero times goes to the forehand and the receiver anticipates the backhand, they have a 60% successful uh, return rate. What you can do is you can draw these basic lines connecting those two extreme points, assuming that this is a continuous function and it's linear and uh, all the basic assumptions to make this kind of work out perfectly and nice and neat and easy. Um, you can complicate things here a little bit, but we'll do the simplistic model that the Thinking Strategically book does. And so what we can see from this model is an equilibrium point. Here, what we're doing is we see that the percentage of successful returns will be 48%. And the server is aiming at the forehand 40% of the time. Now, if we think about this from the server's perspective, if the server tried to aim at the forehand more than 40% of the time, what would end up happening? If they aimed at the forehand more, what the receiver could do is just anticipate the forehand and get a higher percentage of successful returns, which would be bad for the server. The server is trying to minimize the percentage of successful returns. So if we aim at the forehand more than 40% of the time, the receiver anticipates forehand and gets a higher payoff. That's bad for the server. We want it as low as possible. If the server aims at the forehand less than 40% of the time, what the receiver can do is anticipate backhand and get a higher payoff. So we could be, if we were at, say, 10% of serves towards the forehand, the receiver could get something along the lines of 55% of successful returns, which again is higher than the mixed strategy point here. So what ends up happening is the server would like to serve 40% of the balls to the forehand and 60% towards the backhand, leaving the receiver unable to exploit the strategy of the server because they can no longer get a higher payoff by anticipating one side versus the other. And likewise, the receiver would be trying to play a mixture of uh, paying attention to what type of serve the server is going to do. They, on the other hand, would be trying to maximize the payoff, right? So they'd be trying to push it as high as possible. This is basically a result from uh, von, von Neumann and Morgenstern in zero-sum games. It, when player are, players are in a zero-sum game, one player, in this case the server, is attempting to minimize the opponent's maximum, and in the, uh, the other player is trying to maximize the minimum of the payoff. This is known as the minimax theorem, and the surprising point that really comes out of this for most people is that the maximum of the minimum, or the receiver's response in this game, actually is the exact same in terms of the percentage of successful returns as the minimax strategy of the server. So we actually end up at the same point. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some firms in the setting of the Coase theorem where there's some externalities that with low transaction costs or zero transaction costs could be basically bargained away. We're going to use this, you're going to utilize the tools of game theory to analyze firms in that Coase theorem setting. First let's get the logic of the Coase theorem down. Here on the top row we can see the gains to Smith and here we have the damage to Jones. And this question comes from Robert Frank's textbook, Microeconomic Behavior, and it basically sets it up as follows. Smith can produce with or without a filter, and the production without a filter results in greater damage to Jones. The relevant gains and losses are shown in this payoff matrix. The question is as follows, if Smith is not liable for smoke damage and there are no negotiation costs, will he install a filter? So Smith has this right to produce without the filter, so he could produce here, but if he could get some money from Jones to stop, he would have to get at least $45 worth to produce with a filter. So we know that Jones has to pay off Smith at least $45 in order to make him install the filter. 
Now, is Jones willing to do this? The production with a filter makes Jones $50 better off than production without a filter. So Jones is willing to pay up to $50 in order for Smith to produce with a filter. And Smith only needs $45 to produce with a filter. So we'd get some payoff between $45 and $50, and we would have production with a filter. So we get that transaction in a zero transaction cost world towards the most efficient, best outcome, which is produ production with a filter. Now let's look at the interesting result from the Coase theorem, and let's give the property right to Jones. A second question could be, how, if at all, would the outcome be different if Smith were the one liable for all the smoke damage and Jones has the property right? A follow-up question in the Frank textbook puts the Coase theorem into the game theoretic situation. Here we have a payoff matrix from apple growing or pig farming and from choosing rental housing or beekeeping. The question is basically as follows. A and B live on adjacent plots of land each has potent two potential uses for her land. The present values of each depend on the use adopted by the other. The present values are known to both parties and are shown in the table below. Assume zero transaction costs and the ability to create binding agreements. What activities will the two pursue? I suggest that you try and do this on your own. Try and figure out the logic and see what could end up happening here and then listen to my explanation of the logic. So try and see if you can figure this one out and then come back to the video to hear the explanation. For the solution, what we can do is we can look to see how this game would pay, play out. If we look at player one's choices, they can choose between 700 and 650, so rental housing is better or between 400 and 500 where beekeeping is more effective. So we have no dominant solution for player one, but for player two we do. For pig farming, it's 250 better than apple growing and it's 50 better than beekeeping. So player two has a dominant strategy for pig farming. Player one knows this and through normal game theory we would say okay we have a dominant strategy here for player two and thus player one would choose beekeeping and we would end up in this outcome right here. Now, if we have the ability to actually create a binding agreement, and we look at this from the idea of the Coase theorem, however, player two has this dominant strategy of pig farming, but player one knows this. And player one's payouts are at least 150 less if player two is in the pig farming strategy. So player one could offer up to $150 or 150 in payouts to player two to change the solution. Player one doesn't want to be in the pig farming column and doesn't want to end up at the equilibrium uh, that normal game theory results would go to. So what player one can do is try to persuade player two to switch by offering up to 150 in terms of payoffs. They could do that in terms of a trade-off or a bargain. The only way for player one to persuade player two is to get player two's payoff above 450. If player one tries to get player two's payoff above 450 from our equilibrium output here, if we moved over to player two apple growing so that player one could be better off, player one would have to play, pay player two 250 at least to get the payoff better than 450. However, 700 minus 250 will equal 450, which is worse than a payoff of 500 for the player one if they just stay put. So the only way for player one to do this is if they can bindingly commit to having player one do beekeeping and player two will do apple growing. Player one again has a minimum gain of 150 if we move from pig farming to apple growing and we can see that player two 
only has a $50 difference here. So if player one can say, yes, I will do beekeeping, and if you do apple growing, and what I will do is I will give you at least $50, so say $51, then what we could do is I'll pay you $50, you know, plus elf or whatever, to move to apple growing, you will be better off, and I will also be better off than the 500 so our final payoff here would be that player A actually ends up with 599 and player B actually ends up with 451. We can see that this is the most efficient outcome either way uh, just by adding up the total potential payoffs. If you look in this first quadrant, we have a total payoff of 900 here, 850 here, 950, and here 1,050. You know you're going to end up in the most efficient outcome if you have zero transaction costs in the Coase theorem. And what we did is we did a payoff from the dominant solution of $51 uh, in this situation because player one is better off even if they pay $51 and end up with 599 and player 2 or player B gets $51 more than their original payoff which makes them better off than the dominant solution uh, shown by pig farming and beekeeping. Now if we then said okay what if negotiation costs or transaction costs were say $150 or 150 in terms of payoffs? What activities do they pursue now? If transaction costs were 150 it would be impractical to negotiate uh, any agreement here, and A would end up raising pigs, or, or player B will end up raising pigs, and player A or player 1 will end up beekeeping. Uh, so player 1 has no way of making player 2 better off if we had high transaction costs of, say, 150. But without transaction costs, we end up in the most efficient solution through a exchange with the ability to commit to it and we end up with the highest potential payoffs.